Welcome back. Last time, I finished up the bottom end rebuild. This time, the whole engine will get reassembled so it can be put back in the car. The first order of business is to install the cylinder head. I checked the threads with the new head bolt to make sure there was no binding, then I put the new head in place. It took some time to get the head gasket and head properly aligned with the studs. Once it was aligned, I inserted the new head bolts, only snugging them down for now. Next, I got the timing chain and guides in place. I was sure to install the oil pump chain too, since it goes in the first sprocket on the crank. Next, I start to install the timing system, which starts with the exhaust cam sprocket. I turn the engine to top dead center using a screwdriver on top of the first piston to check. Then, both cams are turned so the two dots on top are pointing up. I install the cam locking tool, making sure everything is aligned. The upper timing chains get installed, and then I apply tension to the chain using the tensioner in my timing kit. Now it's time for the various Vano spits to go back on. There are quite a few of these. I won't be explaining all the steps since there are already some much better guides if you're looking for a how-to. So I left these cable tied to each other in alignment when I, when I took them out, which was a good idea and will make this easier. Finally, the cup locking tool can be installed to set the timing. This tool holds the cups in the right spot, preventing the timing from skewing, so the plates can be tightened up. The tool comes off and the timing is set. As a check, I rotate the engine over fully and make sure the cam locking tool still lines up. Everything looks good, so I can move on to the rest of the Vanos. So this is my Vanos that came off of my original cylinder head. This is a Vanos I pulled with a junkyard cylinder head for no extra cost, I might add. I know this one doesn't make any bad noises, so I'm just going to put the seal kit in this, and then I'm going to take the solenoids from this one since they're pretty clean, and as you can see, mine are quite rusty. I removed the seals with a pig, which is quite difficult. You need to cut them to get them out, being careful not to scratch the metal. There's actually two seals per ridge, with one on top of the other. Four total per cylinder. Alright, good enough. With the Vano seals done, I can install the whole unit, making sure to remember the gasket. The reverse threaded screws go in, then the caps, then the big plugs up front. Moving on, it's time for some other bits and pieces to get installed. I don't have a heater core anymore, so I can plug it supply with a special cap. Next, the oil filter housing can go back on. I replaced its gasket last year, so it should still be okay. The Thanos oil feed line goes on, and then I reinstall a secondary air pump block off plate while I'm at it. I hadn't torqued the head bolts yet because I was waiting for the angle measurement tool to arrive. 
I follow the sheet that came with the bolts, starting at a preliminary torque and then torquing in two more stages, 90 degrees both times and in the written order. It occurred to me that this might mess up my timing since the head gas would be compressed more, moving the cams closer to the crank. I checked and sure enough it had moved about 25 thousandths. I did a quick recheck of the timing and only had to adjust it slightly. With that taken care of, I moved on to the oil galleys. I removed their plugs to clean the passages and now they had to be reinstalled. These weirdly aren't a tapered thread and there's nothing they bottom out on, so a thread locker is required. At first, I tried thread sealant, as I saw the 50s kid do, but it wasn't enough. The plug was still loose the next day. It has now been almost 24 hours, and this sealant is completely wet. And it's not holding this in whatsoever. We're gonna try some Loctite instead. So, I cleaned it out and tried some blue Loctite instead. This worked far better, and I was no longer worried it would come loose. Now that much better. There's one more galley in the back of the motor, but it's the same process. Now the timing chain cover can go on. This was difficult to line up since there are bolts going from the top too. I spent a long time cleaning the cover and even now it doesn't look that great, but it's good enough. I still haven't addressed the oil pump, so now it's time. I took apart the pickup tube and bracket from the pump itself, then I popped open the pump. There isn't much to replace in here, just a regulator gasket. Now the regulator plunger comes out, but I have to take the retaining clip off first. This is spring-loaded, and it shot itself across the rim comically, but I didn't catch it on camera. After letting the pump sit in the parts washer for a bit, it came out looking like new. I reinstalled the plunger along with the cap thingy and o-ring. Getting the retaining clip back in was a huge pain, and I had to do it off camera, but I got it eventually. This is going to be fun to get in. Now the gears went back in, making sure the dots faced outwards. After installing the cover, it was time to move on to the pickup tube. I picked up the crusty old o-ring and installed a new one. I'm going to say it's a good idea to replace this o-ring. This is crucial for making sure the engine doesn't get oil starved. After tightening the nut, it's time to install a new oil pan baffle. I drilled out the rivets holding in the old one and filed them down flush. Then I had a friend weld a new baffle in because it's aluminum and very difficult to do yourself. I got that baffle from Vimmerweld and it's got these nice flaps for controlling the oil flow. This will make sure my engine doesn't get oil starved in long, high G corners. Now the oil pump and pickup can be installed on the bottom end. The oil pump sprocket goes on the spline shaft and the reverse threaded nut gets installed. This is known to back off, as we discovered when taking my engine apart, so it needs to be torqued properly and safety wired. Since I knew the rolling torque of the engine was about the same as the torque spec for the nut, I simply turned the engine over to torque it, since my torque wrench doesn't work in reverse. Granted, the pump sprocket is bigger than the crank sprocket, so it'll be a bit tighter, which is probably better, as long as it doesn't strip. I did the best amateur safety wiring I could, I only had to redo it once after breaking it. This is to prevent a nut from being able to back off by spinning to the right, since it's a reverse threaded nut. Welding the nut is also an option, but I'd rather not have to grind inside the engine to get it off. With the nut finished up, I can install the oil pan. Unfortunately, the baffle wasn't welded in as low as possible in the pan, so it was hitting something. The support for the oil pickup needed some shaving. I was careful to wrap everything else in plastic to keep any debris from getting inside the engine. With the pan fitting better, I put some liquid gasket on the seam between the timing cover and block before installing the gasket. The numerous bolts got tightened up and I was sure not to forget the oil level sensor.
I installed the exhaust studs next. These are a bit pricey, but there was no way I was going to reuse the old ones, especially since they were mangled during removal. A quick jam nut makes the install easy, but there's 16 of these, so it takes a while. The water pump is next. It looked like some surface rust had formed in the impeller, but it's not too bad. The thermostat is close by, so I installed that as well. I forgot the bracket for lifting the engine, but I fixed it later. I tapped in the front main seal and installed my new rust converted and painted crank pulley. This thing was orange from rust before. I can finally install a valve cover, which needs a new gasket put in place. First, I decided to flush the engine with some oil, just in case there's any debris that could be cleared out. The spark plugs went in too, and I paid attention to their torque spec. It feels like they're yielding, but it's just a crush washer compressing. I wonder if I had a habit of not tightening these enough because of this. The valve cover goes on at last, making sure the gasket doesn't fall out. New grommet pieces get installed and I tighten them all down. I install all the coils and make sure to attach their grounding straps. The valve cover is finished and it's almost time to take the engine off the stand. First, I'd like to show off my new headers. These are the best quality $100 eBay headers money can buy. They actually look really good. It was satisfying seeing the engine almost complete. I installed the upper O2 sensors from the old headers and left out the lower ones. These aren't needed since there's no cats. We're almost done, I promise. The engine mounts get bolted back on, and yes, I know, I put the right one on upside down. I made sure the surfaces were shiny clean since the grounding strap goes through this one. With the engine finally up the stand, I can install the rear main seal since the stand was in the way. This was tricky to get on since the seal had a flap that is slightly smaller than the crank. I made sure not to forget the two long bolts in the bottom. I went to install the flywheel and discovered it was already a single mass conversion. It's a good thing I noticed this since I can't buy an OEM clutch. I sanded down the clutch surface. I don't really care if the clutch vibrates a little from some imperfections since this is a track car. The flywheel bolts get installed and I decided to use some blue Loctite, most of which wound up on the floor. Nope, I stepped on it. The bolts all got impacted to finish up the engine rebuild. Next time, I'll tackle the clutch and transmission, and then the engine can get reinstalled. There's still plenty to do before the car gets fired up. Wiring harness, fuel system, and exhaust to name a few. So stay tuned to see how it turns out. As always, thanks for watching, feel free to like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.